So once again, I want to say good evening to everybody and welcome to tonight's webinar on extratropical transition. I'm Joe Deli Carpini, the Science and Operations Officer at the Weather Forecast Office in Boston Norton. Always glad to be here with everybody tonight. So let's talk a little bit about extratropical transition. And what you're seeing here is a, a satellite loop. This is from uh, Tropical Storm Henri back last August. It's been almost a year, believe it or not. And you can kind of see, you know, what looks to be, you can definitely see where the storm is, but notice it's looking a little bit more disorganized. We don't have that classic buzzsaw shape to it um, that we normally would see with big hurricanes. Notice you've got, you know, a main blob here of convection or thunderstorms, but notice how it's kind of shearing apart a little bit. It's becoming a lot more disorganized and, you know, really not losing its kind of circular shape. So that's kind of what happens as these storms undergo what's called extratropical transition. So tropical meaning it's a warm core system, meaning warmer air uh, within the storm core. And extratropical storms have colder air at their core. So think about the, the nor'easters, coastal storms, even blizzards. Um, those are extratropical storms. So every storm pretty much as it moves up the coast, you know, there are some cases where they do stay pure tropical systems. Uh, like Hurricane Bob or Hurricane Carol, things like that. But most of them will tend to become extratropical as they head you know, north toward our latitude here in New England and the Northeast. And you can see eventually the system just kind of decays and, and dissipates. So we'll talk about why that happens. And really the main reason is because of jet stream interactions. And we'll show that, how that works a little bit. But really every system kind of undergoes this transition from being pure tropical to extratropical on approach. Now, of course, there are exceptions, as I mentioned, but in most cases, this is what we see. And it, it's kind of defined by rapid acceleration of the coast. As you know, the storms are kind of, we say, in by breakfast and out by dinner. They're usually moving pretty quickly. And we start to see changes in the pattern for rainfall, high winds, and storm surge. So the old rule of thumb is the heavy rainfall is usually focused along and especially to the west of the storm track. And that's what you're seeing here. This is a radar loop of Tropical Storm Irene from back in 2011. I think many of you will remember that. There was devastating flash flooding across parts of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, uh, the Catskills in New York, and especially in western Massachusetts, western Connecticut, where the heaviest rain fell. And notice there's actually very little rain to the east of the track. And most really all the rain tends to be focused to the west. Uh, the high winds are focused to the east of the track. That's where you get your strongest winds, and as well as the storm surge, typically east of the track, um, depending you know, ex on the exact way the storm makes landfall. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but the greatest surge depths will occur on the upper reaches of the south-facing bays. Think Narragansett Bay, Buzzards Bay, and some of the inlets as well, some of the rivers that feed into those as well. So again, it's due to jet stream interactions, which we'll get into a little bit next. Uh, there's rapid acceleration as those stronger winds kind of draw the system into it. And as it becomes extra tropical, heavy rainfall west of the track, high winds and storm surge focused east of the track. Those are our general rules of thumb. So let's talk about the jet stream interactions. What, what's going on here? Well, actually, it, it happens when you have an unusually strong jet stream, almost winter-like. So this time of year in the summer, the jet stream tends to be weaker the strongest winds are shifted well to the north in Canada, so we really don't have a lot, you know, of strong jet stream winds. It's more in the winter time when we have greater temperature contrast. So it's interaction with this polar jet stream that results in the rapid northward acceleration of the storm. It kind of draws it northward and also can lead to remarkable rainfall production, even though the storms are really moving pretty quickly. In some cases, you know, 20, 30 miles per hour or even greater. Um, there's usually an interaction with a cold front or a coastal front. Uh, on, you have onshore flow in most cases, east or southeast winds. And when you that bumps up against the terrain, whether it's the hills in Worcester County, maybe northwest Rhode Island, northern Connecticut, or the Berkshires uh, and Litchfield Hills, that adds, helps wring out the moisture and really adds uh, to the lift, the added lift that occurs. So, uh, again, this is a typical pattern here you're seeing on the right. You've got a big dip in the jet stream across the eastern states that helps draw the system northward. But the stronger jet stream winds to the north um, actually help the system undergo this extratropical transition. And, you know, we always like to say anything with the name of the in the Bahamas is New England's business. And that's certainly true. Um, remember that as we head here in later in August into September as well. So watch the Bahamas. Uh, that's usually going to have some effect on our area if there's a storm down there. All right, so let's get into the details here a little bit. So 
Um, we're going to look at Hurricane Carol, which was the last major hurricane to strike southern New England back in late August of 1954. So um, what we're going to look at here are a number of panels. This is kind of uh, recreated model data, but we're going to look at that. And hopefully you can see this okay. I know it's probably a little tough to see, but on the top left is what we really want to focus on. That's our jet stream, 250 millibars roughly 39,000 feet, and the jet stream is shaded, so the stronger winds are in the blue and even some of the purple here. Uh, so that's really what we want to focus on. And then on the lower right, that's the sea level pressure. So this is where the hurricane actually would be. Um, at this point, it's off the coast of South Carolina on the morning of August 30th. So let's kind of take a look and, and see what happens. You know, um, Also, I should point out, this is the 500 millibar or steering flow. So at the time, the pattern you know, didn't look really conducive for a strike here in southern New England. Uh, there was a little bit of a trough here moving off the East Coast, another trough approaching the Great Lakes. Uh, but, you know, at first glance, you'd say, well, this is going to kind of kick the system out to sea. It's not really a, a deep trough across the eastern U.S. So um, let's kind of see what happens here as we move forward in time. This is on 8 p.m. now um, on August 30th. And notice the jet stream to the north begins to have a little bit of an influence. That's a jet stream that's right over New England here. Um, we notice there's a little bit of what we call a ridge now at 500 millibars. So it's kind of that bump in the contours. Um, just east of New England, kind of over the Atlantic. And what's that going to do? Well, a lot of times what it does is it causes a deeper trough to form along the coast. We see this a lot of times with winter storms, um, whether they're going to track close to the coast or track offshore. And if we can get this ridge, we call it a downstream ridge because it's downstream from us. If we can get this ridge to strengthen the trough, it will cause the trough to deepen uh, along the coast here, and that will help draw any storm farther to the north. So. Notice we've got the storm still tucked in across South Carolina, North Carolina, um, but we're building that ridge um, as the jet stream begins to strengthen a little bit well ahead of the system. So let's see what happens next here. This is the next day on August 31st, and notice we've got more of the ridge strengthening now. It's, it's extending well up into Quebec, um, and that's going to help this trough deepen even more. Notice now we've got a pretty broad trough here in the eastern U.S., and that's going to help steer Carol up the coast. She's already coming up to the mid-Atlantic states at this point. Uh, notice we've got the jet stream um, kind of hanging on. We call it jet max, which is a maximum in the winds. Um, so these two features are going to help draw Carol northward up the coast, and it really has to do with the interaction with the jet stream having an influence on the 500 millibar or 18,000-foot kind of steering level with the storm. And by evening, you can see still kind of a similar pattern. Um, Carol is now getting close to our area. We've got a pretty deep trough here in the east. We still have the jet stream, uh, you know, kind of right over New England just to our north. Um, and that's going to start to cause Carol to at least gain some um, extra, what we call extra tropical characteristics. It will remain tropical as it moves through. But you can see that the, the jet stream helped really strengthen that ridge. And you'll see it happen a little bit more. This is 8 a.m. on September 1st. Notice the storm is now in the area. Ridge has shifted a little bit to the east, but we still have this pretty strong jet stream here. This is going to help focus more rainfall along and west of Carroll's track, and that's certainly what happened. We'll show that in a few minutes. Um, but really just, like I said, extra tropical transition, if you have that jet stream there, it's most likely going to occur. There have been many cases of, of hurricanes, tropical storms, where we don't have the jet stream present, and the transition doesn't really take place. So let's talk a little bit about upslope flow here. This is a critical component for us. And notice if we've got winds out of the east or northeast, it's going to bump up against this terrain and really bring some added lift. So as the winds come off the coastal plain here of Boston Providence, they reach the Worcester Hills, they get some lift. Uh, they sink a little bit in the Connecticut Valley, and that's sometimes what, that's what we call a shadow effect. You'll actually see lower rainfall totals there. And, of course, I think many of you in the wintertime know there can be a little bit of shadow with snowfall totals too. And then we get more enhancement as we get out toward the Berkshires, Litchfield Hills, the Green and White Mountains, certainly the Adirondacks and the Catskills as well. So this in helps, to, helps to enhance rainfall in the upslope areas. And like I said, conversely, it can shadow um, some of the valley locations, Hudson Valley, Connecticut Valley, Merrimack Valley in those cases. Uh, but you can see it's a little smush, but um, from Tropical Storm Irene, you know, more than 15 inches of rain fell in the upslope areas of the Catskills up into the Berkshires and the Green and White Mountains, resulting in just devastating uh, flash flooding in those areas. So from the flooding rain standpoint, the heaviest rain again falls along and west of the track in most cases. 
Um, nearly half of the storms in our region did produce small stream and a river flooding in the region, even when the conditions were dry leading up to the event. Um, I remember back in 1999, Tropical Storm Floyd struck on the heels of a drought. Um, it wasn't as significant as the one we're currently going through, but um, it was a drought buster. It ended up, we ended up having some minor river flooding, some minor small stream flooding, um, but it didn't, it did put a big dent in the rainfall deficit for that summer and, and effectively ended the drought. And speaking of rainfall, the average rainfall for our systems here in southern New England is about six to eight inches. Um, if you have a slower moving storm, you certainly can get some blockbuster rainfall totals. Examples of Diane in 1955 dumped 15 to 20 inches of rain and Irene in 2011. 10 to 16 inches, as I just mentioned, across parts of western Massachusetts, western Connecticut, and eastern New York. And really, it's the high rainfall rates that have been shown to be the main cause of flash flooding, not so much the storm totals. And we had a really good example of that um, last year, which I'll get to in a minute with Ida's remnants. But just from a historical perspective, look at the destructive flooding from Diane. This was in Moonsocket, the image on the left, um, flooding the downtown social and business district, widespread flooding, and also um, produced a 24-hour rainfall amount of 18.15 inches of rain in one day in Westfield. And that stands today as the state record for uh, the most rainfall in one day in Massachusetts. So you can see again, Notice the track of Diane and notice where the heavy rain fell. It's west of the track. So across the, the Poconos into um, Springfield, Westfield area, kind of along the Mass Pike into Boston. But notice how the max rainfall was along and west. Very little, if any, uh, fell to the east, which is very typical of these systems. And you can see here Route 44 West. This is a pretty famous picture in Putnam, Connecticut, of flooding occurring um, right across that roadway. Now with Irene back in 2011, uh, here's a picture from Conway, of Conway Street in Buckland. Again, you can see the heaviest rainfall focused along and west of the track across the mid-Atlantic states um, into parts of southeastern New York and you know western Mass, which were close enough to the track. That's why we say along and west of the track for the heaviest rain and usually the greatest flood threat. Now this is what I wanted to talk about. We saw this just last year with Ida uh, from New York City to Philadelphia. Um, produced historic flash flooding in those two cities. Uh, totals uh, of 8.44 inches in Newark, New Jersey, 6.89 inches at LaGuardia, where the wettest days on record, resulted in 51 fatalities in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And closer to home in Portsmouth, it actually undermined this road here uh, in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Uh, you may have seen that on the news um, from heavy rains and flash flooding. And, you know, here's the track again showing the same theme uh, of, of as it began began to go with uh, extra tropical transition and weaken into a tropical depression. Notice how the heaviest rain, you know, starts to focus along and west of that track. And it certainly did that. You can see in the blues and the purples, a little bit of a zoom up here on the lower right, uh, seeing the track across Long Island and uh, pretty close to the Cape Cod Canal. Uh, and there's the heaviest rain along and west of the track. Now, the interesting thing is really we're starting to learn that the rainfall rates are really the things that cause problems, not the total rainfall. And you can see here, this is a maximum one hour radar estimated precipitation uh, over a, about a 12 hour period. But you can see, you know, totals of three to five inches in one hour across portions of New Jersey, New York City, Southern Connecticut as well. And uh, as our friend uh, Tomer Berg, who used to be a grad student at Albany uh, noted, you can see it was really the rainfall rates uh, many places reported over three to four inches of rain in one hour that overwhelms things like drainage systems that were really not designed to handle that amount of rainfall in such a short time. So again, for tropical systems, it's the rainfall rate that really has more to do as opposed to the total rainfall from the system. All right, so let's move on to storm surge influences. As you know, storms undergo extra tropical transition, as I mentioned, we look to the right of track for the maximum storm surge. And there's a lot of factors that go into it, as I list here. Uh, wind, the angle of approach of the storm, its forward speed, the size of the storm, its pressure, because the lower the pressure, the more of a dome of water it can raise. Um, and then things like the bathymetry, talking about the slope and width of the continental shelf along the, our south coast of New England, it's pretty much flat. So the surge can rise right up. Whereas on the eastern Massachusetts coast into New Hampshire and Maine, there's much more of a shelf that causes, you know, a little bit of a lesser, not lesser surge, but uh, you know, more wave impacts as opposed to pure surge. And of course the shape of the coastline also comes into play. 
So when we talk about the angle of approach and wind speed and forward motion, let's take a look here at, at two notable storms. Uh, we have Hurricane Carol on the left, Hurricane Bob on the right. For our south coast, it's typically less surge, but greater wave damage because those waves can just roll right on in, and especially in those upper bays and the tidal rivers because you have funneling going on, uh, but there's less wave damage. So again, it's Narragansett Bay and the rivers that feed into it. Buzzards Bay as well is another area. Along the east coast, you have a greater potential for surge and wave, wave damage because of the, the continental shelf and the slope of that. So again, in this case, Car um, Carol, Sir, uh, tracked across eastern Long Island, central Connecticut. The greatest surge was focused across Rhode Island and eastern Connecticut, including Narragansett Bay. For Hurricane Bob, the track was from Block Island across southeast Massachusetts. Maximum surge was in a small area uh, across Cape Cod and the islands to the right of track. So that's what we want to look for when we're anticipating those impacts. So some of the concerns here in southern New England, it's been a long time, you know, showing Hurricane Carol as our last Cat 3 back in the 50s there really is the potential for tremendous storm surge on the south facing bays and inlets. In reality, a category three storm, it could bring a 20 to 25 foot surge on the upper Seconet River in Rhode Island and the Seekonk Rivers, upper Buzzards Bay, places like Marion, Massachusetts, uh, could see a surge of 20 to 25 feet, something that many of us have not even seen. And remember that the most significant sur uh, surge occurs within one hour of landfall. Now, the question always is, does that coincide with high tide? Not always. With um, the case last year uh, with Henri, it, it occurred as the tide was rising about the midpoint of the tide. So the surge was far less than it would have been if it occurred at high tide. And we often don't know that until within about 12 to 24 hours, exactly when that surge is going to arrive. But keep in mind that the wave run up causes minor flooding uh, about six hours before the eye arrives. And with Sandy, which was a more extreme example, it was more than 18 hours before the eye arrived on the coast of New Jersey. So it depends on the size and strength of the storm, certainly. Uh, but you're going to see surge typically about six hours before the arrival of that eye. Now, just to show the potential, these are reference maps that we use. And this is a simulated Category 3 hurricane moving to the north-northeast at 30 miles per hour. And we're looking for reference at southern Rhode Island, Buzzards Bay area. So these areas from westerly up through the uh, through Newport, roughly, would see about a 7 to 10 foot surge if we had a Category 3 hurricane moving north-northeast at 30 miles per hour. Whereas the upper end of, of Narragansett Bay, Seconet River, Seekonk River would see a surge of 10 to 18 feet. Again, many, not many of us have seen that. That hasn't occurred really since going back to the 50s. And if we shift a little bit farther to the east, I'm, I'm sorry, if we do a different storm, let's say a, a really rapidly accelerating hurricane moving north, Category 3 hurricane moving north at 60, would see an 11 to 18 foot surge from westerly to Newport and a 15 to 21 foot surge on the upper end of Narragansett Bay. So again, an extreme example, but certainly within the realm of possibility, something we need to be aware of. So let's talk about the high winds next. So as you know, the radius of high winds will vary considerably. Um, with Hurricane Bob, it was only 25 miles across, so fairly narrow, just affected a small corridor of Cape Cod and the islands, particularly Martha's Vineyard. And with the 1930 hurricane, it was fairly wide, 50 miles. So as I mentioned, it's focused east of the track, and it's enhanced by the acceleration toward New England. So it dramatically adds to the gust potential. The rule of thumb is you take the forward motion of the storm, say it's 30 miles per hour, and you add that to the maximum sustained wind. So if we had a, a maximum sustained wind of 90 miles per hour in, in the storm, moving 30 miles per hour, you can expect gusts around 120 miles per hour. And with the 1938 hurricane, Blue Hill Observatory recorded the highest gusts on record. Five minutes sustained wind of 121 miles per hour with a peak gust of 186 miles per hour. Now, the thing is, our trees are not weathered for strong winds out of the south or southeast. I think we'll all remember Irene. There was considerable tree damage east of the track across Rhode Island and eastern Massachusetts. Some communities were without power for two to three weeks. Our trees are more hardened for the more common wind directions. Think about the northwest winds, the west winds or the north northeast winds that we experience with coastal storms, the trees are more hardened for that. So when we get a storm that tracks west of New England, that's something we need to be aware of. The tree damage will be exacerbated by the fact that they're just not weathered or used to it, uh, the south or southeast winds. So something to keep in mind. Now the short duration 
Uh, there's typically a short duration because of the rapid movement of sustained tropical storm and hurricane force winds. So the tropical storm force winds are typically on the order of about 12 hours. That's why we say in for breakfast, out by dinner. And the hurricane force winds even smaller window, typically three to six hours. And just some notable wind speeds are noted there from Carol, Donna, and Bob, um, again, all east of the track. Uh, but this is part of the behavior even with extra tropical transition, it doesn't have to be a purely tropical storm. We see the same impacts uh, when a storm undergoes its extra tropical transition as well. Now, tropical tornadoes are interesting because uh, we do, you know, on occasion see them. I remember with Irene, we had a number of circulations off the coast that were likely water spouts, uh, but never made landfall. That's a good thing. Uh, but typically, with, you know, tropical storms, hurricanes, or even tropical depressions or remnants. Remember last year we had three, uh, what was it, Fred, I think, uh, Henri, and, and even Ida gave us uh, remnant tornadoes across Massachusetts. So uh, typically 60% of landfalling hurricanes will produce tornadoes. Most of these are northeast of the center where we have better uh, shear in place and other parameters. But um, notice that only about 25% are within what we call close to the center, within about 125 miles. Really, it's the outer rain bands up to 400 miles away from the storm that can produce these tornadoes. And again, this can even occur undergoing extra tropical transition. It doesn't have to maintain its pure tropical characteristics. And of course, as I mentioned, we know that the remnants of these storms can also produce tornadoes across our area. Just take a look at last year. Uh, we had a number of those throughout the summer. So really what, you know, I want to just wrap up with here is, you know, we need to ask ourselves whether it's a tropical system or when they're undergoing extra tropical transition. Uh, you know, the messaging will be the same. We would maintain hurricane watches and warnings, tropical storm watches and warnings now. Um, you might see something what's called a post-tropical system, meaning it's kind of lost its tropical characteristics, but we keep the headlines as the same. We keep the with the ones from the National Hurricane Center going. But, you know, really, as we go through the summer here, it's been a very quiet hurricane season. So the one thing, you know, we all need to ask ourselves is really, can we stand on our own feet for two to three days after a major hurricane strike? Probably longer. Uh, you know, we're going to need to be self-sustaining before federal resources and state resources swing into action. You're not going to be the only one requesting help. So uh, the more pre-pending you do now, the rest stressful the event will be. Always have an emergency kit. And uh, I'll show some a website at the end that we can we can talk about. But really, are you ready to deal with widespread and long duration loss of utilities? You know, keep in mind, power outages could last for several weeks. Um, Gloria, 1985 was category one hurricane. Parts of the area had no power for over two weeks. Irene was a tropical storm, 60 mile per hour winds and power was out for one to two weeks in some locations. So think about what a strong category one, category two or category three hurricane could do in our area. We have a lot more foliage, a lot more tree tree coverage in our area. Uh, so, you know, that's just something to consider. And also loss of phone and, and communication cell towers will likely be down. And in, in 1954, Carol took all the phone lines down. Uh, you know, there are still phone lines out there. Many of us have gone, you know, fiber optic, but there's still, uh, you know, connections for that. And of course, cell phones as well. So, you know, again, things to be thinking about. And you know, ready to, if you live along the coast, you know, widespread structural damage to properties, think about time to uh, be able to remove debris, um, getting access into the devastated areas. You may not be able to get home if you've evacuated. Then there's contamination uh, from fuels, natural gas lines, ripped up septic systems, and transportation of supplies, getting supplies into the area, especially for the islands. Think about Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard. If ferry services are suspended, how are they going to get fuel, food, and water, and other supplies? You know, it could be a few days uh, until it's safe for the, the boats to travel again. So just things to, be, to keep in the back of your mind as, as we kind of talk about our tropical season here. And, you know, the best thing to do, uh, you know, we're all kind of doing this at work, believe it or not, at the office. Have a hurricane plan. And you can go on our website, weather.gov slash box, or I'm sorry, weather.gov slash safety slash hurricane. There's plenty of resources there uh, for you to go through. So definitely, you know, we have an active above average season forecast. It's been very quiet. I think things could, you know, kind of get going very rapidly. Not saying we're going to have a landfall here, but 
you know, we certainly have to be ready for that as we get through late August into September. So definitely have a hurricane plan, and I really encourage everyone to visit this site. Like I said, at, the, at our office, we're kind of encouraging everybody, everybody to do the same. Uh, you know, have a plan for those who are going to be at home while we're at work, uh, so they're safe as well. So definitely think about having a hurricane plan as we get a little bit later into August here and the season starts to heat up. So with that, uh, that is it on Extra Tropical Transition. I didn't want to go into too much detail on the jet stream, so I hope it wasn't too complicated. It can really be a very complicated topic about how all these different processes work, but just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of really the importance of having that jet stream somewhere in the Northeast. Typically, it's Great Lakes, maybe Quebec or northern New England, uh, but when that jet stream is up there, that's typically when we start to see the storm undergo kind of that extra tropical transition. So I will pause here and I will go through any questions if we have any, uh, and then we'll get to our weather briefing. So let's see. Um, from Kerry, uh, the perfect storm was extra tropical, as was Sandy and Irene. I'm wondering how the perfect storm would have been classed had it occurred today as opposed to 1991. Yeah, you know, Kerry, it probably would have been classified as a tropical system. Um, it actually was. But they didn't want to have too much confusion over it being, you know, late October. There were a number of factors that went into it. So it was actually a decision that was made um, at the higher levels of actually NOAA uh, to keep it, you know, not a named storm. So um, it definitely, you know, definitely was, it was a big storm. And we did a nice anniversary retrospective on it last year, which uh, you can probably check out on YouTube, too. So, um, yeah, that, that definitely was an extra tropical storm. From Kevin, does the interaction and position of the polar jet stream and fronts play a role in transition? Yeah, it does. Um, you know, in some cases with the jet stream, Kevin, um, it can actually help form what's called a pre or, or a predecessor rainfall event. So in other words, if the, the storm is well down in the Carolinas, uh, hundreds of miles to the north, the jet stream can actually cause an additional band of heavy rain to form well in advance of the storm known as a pre. And that can actually cause flash flooding and people are actually actually caught off guard. They're waiting for the main rain from the storm to come. And then you have this pre-event that occurs and causes a lot of flash flooding. We've had a few of those here in southern New England, too. Uh, you can get a quick four, five, six, seven inches of rain. But, yeah, um, it, it certainly does. For our area here in New England, just to get back to your question, Kevin, uh, the research has shown you want to have that jet stream somewhere near the Great Lakes, maybe Quebec, northern New England, somewhere in there, sometimes over southern New England too. But somewhere in the northeast, we have to have that strong jet max or you know jet maximum, kind of a core of stronger winds for that to take place. So that's something we look at actually as we watch where a storm is going to track. Do we have that jet stream in place to help it undergo that transition? Uh, from JP, the flooding in Buckland didn't occur until well after the storm had passed and made its way down from more northern areas. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, that's a good point, JP. So it was actually from runoff from some of the other rivers and streams um, that caused the flooding in Buckland. Um, that was one of the areas that we surveyed afterwards. So thanks for that clarification. Uh, let's see. From Kevin also, have certain extratropical transition storms been associated with higher rainfall totals and the low-level jet enhancing flash flooding. Um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, a majority of the ones that, that go on, undergo that transition, um, they can all produce higher rainfall totals. Um, you know, and it's sometimes having that added low-level jet can certainly bring more moisture, bring more moisture convergence, and enhance those totals. So, yeah, that, that's definitely one of the recipes we have, Kevin, uh, for that. Um, and were the wind gusts enhanced in Hurricane Bob due to its acceleration? Yes. So that's why I said on the right-hand side of the storm, the right of track, we take the sustained wind speed and add to it the storm's forward motion. And that's usually a good uh, estimate of the maximum gust that you can expect. It has to do with the momentum as the storm races northward. It can enhance the wind gust potential. And let's see, from Eric, how much preparation do people in central mass like Worcester do in face of hurricanes and extratropical storms? Great question. All depends on the track, Eric. So I would be prepared for pretty much everything but storm surge. Uh, definitely the flooding rains being in a more inland area. Um, but if the storm tracks to the west, maybe across closer to the Hudson Valley, then you're going to be on the windy side of the storm. So you need to be prepared for the damaging winds. You know, embedded tornadoes, yes, less likely. But I would say the main two things would be the flooding rain and the damaging winds. Those would be your main concerns. Obviously not storm surge being so far inland. So uh, again, that's going to be more storm dependent. 
Um, I would say in more cases, you're going to be dealing with the flooding rains as opposed to the damaging winds, but obviously can't rule it out based upon the storm's track. So great question. We normally are so focused for coastal residents that we don't always have um, preparations for inland areas. And that's why we're really focusing on the flooding uh, so much because that's such a hidden hazard that people often catches people by surprise, the inland flooding, which is often the more, kind of one of the more dangerous parts in addition to the storm surge along the coast. Uh, let's see from Ronald. He's read research that indicated that there was an especially unique weather pattern set up for the 38 hurricane that allowed it to stay strong even upon landfall. Yeah, you'd have to go back. Um, we actually did a, a, a webinar on that, Ron, if you want to go check it out on YouTube. And one of our, our meteorologists, Bill, actually did a, a kind of a re-simulation using his model, weather model. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, kind of a, a pattern up the coast, uh, warm water, you know, and, and not having that extra tropical transition. Um, so it just maintained its, it, it, and it accelerated too. So the jet stream helped accelerate it, but um, didn't quite undergo the pure, what we call extra tropical transition in that case. But the acceleration uh, was one factor that really brought uh, the, the added damage to the area, adding that 60 mile per hour uh, forward motion to it. Uh, right, and as you say, moving 50 to 60 miles per hour. Um, but yeah, that was also part of the setup interaction with the jet stream. That's the acceleration right there. So let's see, I don't see any more questions coming in. So um, we can